Hey peeps, welcome back to the Majesty of Reason. I'm Joe Schmidt, and today we're looking at Aquinas' third way, or something close enough. So, without further ado, let's dig in. So, as usual, it's useful to get an outline of my video. So, firstly, we're going to be looking at the actual passage in the Summa Theologiae Prima Pars, question to Article 3, then we're going to be looking at definitions of the relevant terms at play, then we're going to be looking at different formal reconstructions, after which we go to an outline of the main problems, and then the main problems themselves that I have with these premises in my formulation, and then we're going to be looking at a conclusion. So let's go on to the passage in the Summa Theologiae. So Aquinas writes that the third way is taken from possibility and necessity, and runs thus. We find in nature things that are possible to be and not to be, since they are found to be generated and to corrupt, and consequently they are possible to be and not to be. But it is impossible for these always to exist. For that which is possible not to be at some time is not. Therefore, if everything is possible not to be, then at one time there could have been nothing in existence. Now, if this were true, even now there would be nothing in existence, because that which does not exist only begins to exist by something already existing. Therefore, if at one time nothing was in existence, it would have been impossible for anything to have begun to exist. And thus, even now, that nothing would be in existence, which is absurd. Therefore, not all beings are merely possible but there must exist something, the existence of which is necessary. But every necessary thing either has its necessity caused by another or not. Now it is impossible to go on to infinity in necessary things which have their necessity caused by another, as has already been proved in regard to efficient causes. Therefore we cannot but postulate the existence of some being having of itself its own necessity, and not receiving it from another, but rather causing in others their necessity. This all men speak of as God. End quote. Apparently women don't speak of it as God. I'm, I'm just kidding. So the first thing to note is that this argument actually lends itself to a wide variety of incompatible interpretations. So for example, um, Dr. Daniel Bonavac thinks that uh, Aquinas is really trying to get at a kind of subtraction argument and then using a kind of something analogous to S5 modal logic in order to infer that there is a necessary being. So uh, he, for instance, says that, well, suppose that everything were contingent, well, then we could kind of subtract those things from one another and then go across worlds, eventually subtracting contingent entities such that we get an empty world, uh, a world that is completely empty if everything were contingent. But then in that world, our world would not be possible relative to that world because there would be nothing in that world that could you know, bring our world into being. Uh, if our world were possible relative to that world, then there would have to be something with the causal power to bring about our world in that world. But since that world is empty, nothing has the relevant causal power in that world, in which case our world is actually not possible relative to that world. But according to a kind of uh, S5 modal logic, all worlds are possible relative to all other worlds. And so um, we get a contradiction from the supposition that everything is contingent, hence there must be something necessary. So that's how Daniel Bonavac kind of reads uh, Aquinas, or at least something similar to Aquinas' third way here. And other people think that Aquinas is talking about like infinite past and an infinite time, and uh, if you had an infinite past, well then if everything were corruptible, then eventually, you know, they'd kind of run out of steam together. Um, other people still use other interpretive frameworks. It's kind of an interpretive mess, so it's, it's probably a bad idea for me, to, <laughs> for me to be making this video, but I'm just going to try to use an interpretive framework from Tim, Dr. Timothy Paul, a classical theist scholar, uh, Dr. Edward Fazer, Maimonides, who is a medieval Jewish philosopher and theologian, and my own kind of quasi third way argument. I'm explicitly saying that it's a quasi third way argument because I don't want to be crucified for allegedly misrepresenting the specific line of reasoning that Aquinas is, is going after. So I want to say that it's, it's either the third way or something near enough. So by my lights, it seems that the argument of the third way is pretty much the same as the argument that Maimonides gives in his The Guide of the Perplexed. It's one of Maimonides' arguments for God's existence, which he says comes from Aristotle, but uh, actually, according to the translator of my book, The Guide of the Perplexed, uh, it actually comes from Avicenna, or Ibn Sina. So, um, 
he basically says, like, look, when we're talking about the existence of things perceived by the senses, there are three cases that must apply, there being no others possible. So these are like three options. They are mutually exclusive and they're mutually exhaustive. Either nothing is subject to generation and corruption, or everything is subject to generation and corruption, or some things are permanent while others are transitory. And then he says that first alternative is clearly absurd, right? Because we see things coming into being and so on. And then the second alternative, he says, is also absurd. Because look, he says, if everything were subject to generation and corruption, then every single thing would be liable to seize. As you know, however, in a species, that which is possible must necessarily come to pass. It is therefore unavoidable that existing things should perish. If all are destroyed, it is absurd that anything should exist, since no one would remain in existence so as to bring other things into existence. It would therefore necessarily follow that nothing at all exists. However, we can observe that things exist, and we ourselves exist. And so from this it follows, if there exist things that come into being and perish, then there must also exist some being that neither comes into being nor perishes. He calls an unborn and imperishable being cannot be thought of as liable to perish. Uh, it must exist by necessity, not by possibility. And so if you want to read the rest of it, you can. But I did just want to kind of point out this passage up here and this stuff up here. These are very, very, very similar to uh, Aquinas's third way. And so that's going to kind of inform um, the uh, interpretations that I'm going to be uh, attributing to the third way, or at least the qu a quasi third way, something like the third way. And then of course, um, if you guys wanted to know what if, if you read these, sometimes he, he says, like, look, as has been shown in the 19th proposition, if you're curious, this is the 19th proposition, this is the 20th, this is the 21st, that, that he uses in his argument, in his arguments for God's existence. The white things, that's just from my notes. Let's get on to definitions that are needed for understanding Aquinas' third way. So I have already been through this pet accidents versus per se definitional slide. Uh, if you're curious, you can watch my video on Aquinas's first way to hear me articulate these, but I'm going to give you like the, the what, 25 second rundown. Um, so pet accident series, of course, uh, these are causal series that are linear and, and they are in that sense extended over time. And the members of the chain uh, within pet accidents chains have the causal power or causal property of the series in a non-derivative or non-instrumental manner. They have the causal power or, other, or property of the series of themselves. By contrast, Petisse series are hierarchical instead of linear, and they are simultaneous or concurrent instead of extended over time, and the non-fundamental members or the non-first members in Petisse chains, are uh, they have the causal power or ca causal property of the series in a, in a wholly derivative or instrumental manner. So the next things that we need to define are necessity and contingency. So uh, this is from Timothy Paul. He says, when Aquinas calls something necessary in this argument, he means that it is not subject to generation or corruption. A necessary being exists, but it does not come into existence by composition, and it cannot cease to exist by way of decomposition. Similarly, a possible being in this context exists, but it does or could have come into existence by way of composition, and it can cease to exist by way of decomposition. Now, when we come to my quasi-formulation, uh, I will be using the following def definitions, and I'm kind of following what Aquinas says that uh, we find in nature things that are possible to be and possible not to be. So I just think I, I'm taking basically things that are possibly existent, but also possibly non-existent to be contingent things. That's how I'm going to use it in my formulation. And then things are things things that are not contingent are going to be necessary things. Uh, that is to say, they are not possibly non-existent. Uh, again, I'm I'm calling I'm specifically calling it a quasi formulation because I I want to explicitly recognize that I am defining contingent and necessity necessary in this way. And whether or not it's a stipulated de definition or not, um, I'm not going to concern myself with that. I'm just going to say that listen, this is a quasi formulation of Aquinas' third way. It's either Aquinas' third way or something near enough. It'll make more sense uh, as we go on as to why I call it a quasi-formulation. So let's look at Timothy Paul's formulation of the third way. So as Paul articulates it, uh, premise one, some things are able to be generated or corrupted. Uh, that's pretty obvious. I mean, like, for instance, I was born and I'm going to die, so uh, I'm able to be generated or corrupted. Um, and if some things are able to be generated or corrupted, then it is possible for those things either to exist or not to exist, right? Like it's possible for me to exist. It's also possible for me not to exist because, well, for instance, there was some time at which I didn't exist and there will be some time at which I don't exist. And so it follows that it is possible for some things to exist or not to exist. Remember, that's how I defined contingent being earlier, uh, something which is such that it is possibly existent, but also possibly non-existent. And then Paul says in premise three, 
If, for each thing, it is possible that it not exist, then at some time it does not exist. Uh, and so it follows that if, for each thing, at some time it does not exist, then at some time nothing exists. And then premise four, if at some time nothing exists, then there would have been nothing to cause another thing to exist. But if there had been nothing to cause another being to exist, well, then nothing could have come into existence, right? Uh, you know, you can't get something from nothing. So the argument goes, if nothing could have come into existence, then nothing would even exist now. And of course, something does exist now, right? In which case, we get that something could have come into existence. And then we can also conclude that there had to have been something to cause another thing to exist, in which case, at no time did nothing exist. Because look, if at some time nothing exists, then there would have been nothing to cause another thing to exist, right? Uh, but now we got that there had to have been something to cause another thing to exist, in which case, uh, it's simply false that at some time nothing exists, uh, which is to say that at no time did nothing exist. From C5 and C2, it follows that it is not true that for each thing, at some time, it does not exist. And in which case, there must be something that is not possible not to exist. That is, there must be a necessary being. It follows from this third premise and this sixth conclusion. If you want, you can pause it and then look uh, and make sure that the inference follows. It does. Premise eight, a necessary being has a cause for its necessity from something else, or it doesn't. But it's not possible for there to be an infinite series of beings with their necessity from something else, uh, in which case there must be some necessary being with its necessity not from something else. If every single necessary being were such that it derives its necessity from something else, then you'd have uh, necessary being one deriving it from necessary being two, necessary being two deriving it from necessary being three, and so on ad infinitum. But that's not possible per premise nine, in which case at least one of the necessary things must be such that it does not derive its necessity from something else. Tim Paul says in conclusion nine, we call that necessary being whose necessity comes from nothing else, God, in which case God must exist. So Paul's formulation says. Now, as Paul correctly points out with respect to the inference from premise three to conclusion two, quote, without the help of an implicit premise, the inference is invalid and commits the fallacy of composition, end quote. Technically speaking, it would have been better to describe the fallacious inference as a quantifier shift fallacy as opposed to a fallacy of composition, but the two are closely related. So I will discuss the quantifier shift fallacy further in a later portion of this video. But for now, it's just useful to point out that Tim Paul himself has explicitly stated that this is a version of a quantifier shift fallacy by means of pointing out that it's a fallacy of composition. He basically makes the exact same point. And the mistaken inference, according to Paul, is from three to two, right? It doesn't follow from the fact that if for each thing it's possible that it not exist, then at some time it does not exist, right? It doesn't follow from that that if for each thing there is some time at which it doesn't exist, you cannot thereby infer that there is some time at which nothing exists. It's not, it's not a universal uh, generalization there. So now let's move on to my kind of quasi-formulation. So this is my quasi-formulation of the third way or something near enough. And I'm going to be using the sense of contingency that I articulated up here, the sense of necessity and contingency. Uh, we will look at some reasons for challenging my use of that later. But for now, you're just going to have, we're just going to have to deal with it. And uh, we're just going to see how I'm articulating this. So premise one says that every contingent thing is such that there is a time at which it does not exist. Uh, you know, this kind of captures what Aquinas says when he says that um, things that are possible to be and not to be, right? He says that that which is possible not to be at some time is not. So that which is possibly non-existent at some time is uh, non-existent. That's, a, that's what this is meant to capture. Every contingent thing is such that there is a time at which it doesn't exist. Now, we're going to suppose for reductio that everything is a contingent thing. Well, then per those first two premises, right, everything is such that there is a time at which it doesn't exist. Now, if everything is such that there is a time at which it doesn't exist, then there is a time t such that possibly nothing exists at t. And so this is meant to be capturing what Aquinas says when he says that, therefore, if everything is possible not to be, right, if everything is contingent, in which case, if everything is such that there is some time at which it doesn't exist, well then, at one time, right, then there exists some time t, such that there could have been, so such that it's possible at that time, 
that there could have been nothing in existence. So then there's some time such that it's possible at that time that nothing existed. That's really what where that premise comes from. And so let's go back to my quasi formulation. Okay, so now we're here. If everything is such that there is a time at which it doesn't exist, then there is a time t such that possibly nothing exists at t. Everything could have, for instance, failed to exist at that time or could have gone out of existence uh, at that time. But premise five, if it were the case that nothing exists at t, then it would be impossible for something to begin to exist at or later than t, right? Because there's literally nothing in existence at t so as to bring things about by means of its causal power into existence, right? Uh, and you can't get something from nothing. You would have to get it from some kind of existing thing. But if it would be impossible for something to begin to exist at or later than t, then it would be impossible for something to exist now. But it cannot be impossible for something to exist now. After all, it's literally actual that something exists now. So it can't be, it's not as though it could be impossible for something to exist now. In which case, it cannot be the case that nothing exists at t. That follows from uh, 5 through 7. Uh, therefore, not everything is such that there is a time at which it doesn't exist. It follows from 4 and 8. Uh, therefore, we get a contradiction, right? Everything is such that there's a time at which it doesn't exist. That's premise three. But also, not everything is such that there is a time at which it doesn't exist, right? That's what we just got in premise nine. And that's absurd, right? We just got a contradiction. In which case, we can say not everything is a contingent thing, right? That falls from two. We supposed for reductio that everything is a contingent thing. Then we got a contradiction. Uh, and hence, we can negate two, right? We can say, therefore, not everything is a contingent thing. In which case, given that contingent is just non-necessary and necessary is non-contingent, we get that there is at least one necessary thing, n. Now, let's go on to the sec kind of second stage, as it were. So we just ended with, therefore, there is at least one necessary thing, n. Now, every necessary thing is either necessary per se, that is to say, of itself or through itself, or derives its necessity from without. But chains of deriving necessity from without cannot be infinite. But if every necessary thing derived its necessity from without, then there would be an infinite chain of deriving necessity from without, right? You just get A deriving its necessity from without, namely B, and then B deriving its necessity from without from C, and so on, ad infinitum. Uh, so not every necessary thing derives its necessity from without, right? If they cannot be infinite, if such chains of deriving necessity from without cannot be infinite, but if every necessary thing derived its necessity from without, then it would be infinite. Well, then it just follows that not every necessary thing derives its necessity from without. If there is at least one necessary thing, and not every necessary thing derives its necessity from without, and if every necessary thing is either necessary per se or derives its necessity from without, then there is at least one thing that is necessary per se. If you reflect on this premise, it's just, it's pretty self-evident, right? Like, listen, if there's at least one thing that's necessary and not every necessary thing derives its necessity from without, well, then we have at least one necessary thing that doesn't derive its necessity from without. And if we have at least one necessary thing that doesn't derive its necessity from without, then we have at least one necessary thing that is necessary per se, because these are exhaustive. Either it's necessary per se or it derives its necessity from without. And therefore, there exists at least one thing that is necessary per se. And in premise 19, if there exists at least one thing that is necessary per se, then God exists, and hence God exists. Now, I have four primary criticisms of this quasi-formulation. Uh, I'm going to argue that premise 1 is false, or at least unjustified, and I'm going to argue that the same is true for premise 4, premise 6, and premise 19. So let's get on to premise 1. So recall premise 1. Every contingent thing is such that there is a time at which it doesn't exist. This is at least intended to capture something like what Aquinas says when he says that which is possible not to be at some time is not, i.e. that which is possibly non-existent is such that there is a time at which it does not exist. Now, the problem with this, as I've defined contingent and necessity earlier, is that it seems to just be a non sequitur, right? It simply doesn't follow from the fact that X is possibly not existent, that there is actually some time at which it doesn't exist. It seems eminently plausible that there could be an everlasting contingent thing, as I've defined contingent. That is to say, something that is quote-unquote possible not to be, but which is nevertheless such that it is false, that there is some time at which it is not. Uh, this premise one then seems implausible to my mind.
Now, the natural response to that is to say, well, hold on a second, like Joe, Aquinas did not define contingent necessity as you did. He's talking about a different kind of modality. And so uh, once you take into account Aquinas' modal metaphysics and or philosophy of nature, you can avert this, this criticism that I'm leveling here, namely the non sequitur criticism. Um, so for instance, uh, we're going to be looking at Ed Fazer's articulation of this kind of response to what I just said, essentially. Uh, and this is from his book on Aquinas uh, in my PDF. It's page 84 out of 173. Um, so Fazer writes, and this is a long quote. I'll tell you when it's over. So this is Fazer. What Aquinas does mean by possible not to be is indicated by the reason he gives for saying that some things are possibly either existent or non-existent, namely that we observe them to be generated and corrupted. For Aquinas, generation and corruption, coming into being and passing away, characterize the things of our experience because they are composites of form and matter. Their coming to be is just the acquisition by a certain parcel of matter of a certain form, and their passing away is just a loss by a certain parcel of matter of a certain form. Hence, it is ultimately this composite hylomorphic nature that makes it the case that they are quote-unquote possible to be and not to be. The possibility in question is not some abstract logical possibility, but rather something inherent, a tendency to be corrupted rooted in the nature of those things, whose matter is subject to contrariety of forms. In other words, given that the matter out of which the things of our experience is composed is always inherently capable of taking on forms different from the ones it happens currently to instantiate, these things have a kind of inherent metaphysical instability that guarantees that they will at some point fail to exist. They have no potency or potential for changeless, indefinite existence. Hence, they cannot exist indefinitely. By quote-unquote possible not to be, then, what Aquinas means is something like having a tendency to stop existing, or inherently transitory, or impermanent. And by necessary, he just means something that is not like this, something that is everlasting, or permanent, or non-transitory. Thus, there is no fallacy in his inference from such and such is possible not to be, to such and such at some time is not. For this would follow given an Aristotelian understanding of the nature of material substances. Given enough time, such a substance would, if left to itself, have to go out of existence eventually. There is no sense to be made of the idea that it might be quote-unquote possible for it not to exist, and yet that it never, in fact, goes out of existence, no matter how much time passes and even if nothing acts to frustrate its tendency towards corruption. For in that case, the claim that it has an inherent tendency towards corruption would be unintelligible. Something that always exists would, by that very fact, show that it is something whose nature does not include any inherent tendency towards corruption, and thus that it is necessary, in the sense articulated earlier. End quote. I don't think that this rejoinder, or this response, is satisfying. So, first, if we understand contingent in the sense of corruptible, with corruptible meaning having some tendency or disposition for non-existence, premise one, as I've articulated, it still doesn't follow, right? This is because tendencies or dispositions have manifestation conditions. That is to say, conditions whose satisfaction induces the tendency or disposition to produce its characteristic manifestation. Consider a phosphorus match. This match has the tendency or disposition to produce flame and heat. But it's simply false that the match does, at some time or other, produce flame and heat. Rather, all it means is that provided that certain conditions obtain, that is, the matches being dry, the environments being oxygen-rich, the matches being struck, and so on, the match will manifest flame and heat. But some matches live their whole lives with such conditions never being met, and hence live their whole lives without this tendency or disposition ever being manifested. And what this tells us is that even if contingency is understood in the sense of a tendency or disposition for non-existence, it doesn't thereby follow that each contingent thing at some time fails to exist. This would only follow if each contingent thing were such that the manifestation conditions for its tendency or disposition for non-existence would at some point be satisfied. But neither Aquinas, as far as I can tell, nor Phaser, certainly there, gives us any reason whatsoever for thinking that this is true, for thinking that every contingent thing is such that its manifestations, manifestation conditions for its tendency or disposition for non-existence, will at some point be satisfied. Indeed, it seems easy to come up with scenarios that falsify it. I mean, consider, for instance, a universe in which the only entity that exists is an electron, or electron-like particle without physical structural components. Perhaps we need to include space and or time as other entities, but that doesn't make any difference to my scenario or argument here. 
So the only thing in this world is just an electron, say, moving at a constant velocity in the void, as it were. Now, in such a world, or I guess I should say physical world, in such a physical universe, it seems clear that the electron would just go on doing its own thing from everlasting to everlasting, even if God is sustaining it. Uh, again, nothing else would come along to cause its form and matter to come apart, since nothing else exists in such a world, and no internal physical structure could make the particle decay or decompose into simpler elements. The only manifestation conditions, at least in the physical world itself, and not including God's withholding his sustaining power, right, I'm not talking about existential inertia here, we're talking about manifestation conditions. Um, the only manifestation conditions for this tendency or disposition in the physical world, for the electron's tendency or disposition for non-existence, those are t entirely absent, these manifestation conditions. And hence, even though the electron has the tendency or disposition for non-existence, it is false that the electron would at some point cease to exist. In which case, we have in this scenario, which seems eminently possible, a counterexample to uh, uh, the conjunction of what Phaser says here with premise one. And yeah, so it just, so long as this scenario is even possible, or even epistemically possible, right, we have a counterexample, or in the case of epistemic possibility, we have a defeater for premise one, even after considering what uh, Phaser says on its behalf. Now, secondly, no justification is provided for why um, everything which is a form-matter composite is such that its matter is subject to a contrariety of forms. Uh, recall that this was one of the central motivations Phaser gave for the claim that the material composite things of our experience have the tendency or disposition for non-existence that Aquinas' argument requires. For all Phaser has shown, some material things could be such that their form and matter are necessarily conjoined with one another, or they're inseparable, such that once they are, uh, once a form informs matter, actualizes the matter, they are inseparable from then on out, say. No justification was given for that, but a justification would need to be provided for that in order for Phaser's argument, Phaser and Aquinas' argument to succeed, and hence their arguments don't succeed. So, so this objection, so my second response here goes. Again, because this this point about the contra being subject to a contrariety of forms was one of the central motivations that Phaser gave for that that claim concerning the tendency or disposition for non-existence of the material composite objects of our experience. Thirdly, uh, once we grant that this is the sense of contingent at play in the argument, namely being corruptible, well, generatable or corruptible, I guess I guess I should say, the argument will only arrive at a non-corruptible and non-generatable thing. That is to say, we can call that an everlasting thing. So all this argument will be able to get us to then is just an everlasting thing that doesn't have its everlastingness from without, and instead has its everlastingness of itself. That doesn't even tell that the being in question exists of metaphysical necessity in the robust cannot fail to exist sense. And that seems to strengthen the gap problem considerably. The argument wouldn't even then get to a, a like a ne metaphysically necessarily existent being. It only gets to something that has that is everlasting and has its everlastingness of itself. That is to say, it doesn't derive its everlastingness from without. Again, I think that this this non sequitur problem for premise one, even in light of Phaser's kind of rejoinder here, I think it survives the rejoinder for these three reasons. So uh, now let's go on to premise four. So recall premise four. If everything is such that there is a time at which it doesn't exist, then there is a time t such that possibly nothing exists at t. So the principal problem that I see with this premise uh, is that the consequent seems, by my lights, simply not to follow from the antecedent, primarily because it commits a quantifier shift fallacy or something near enough. Merely from the fact that each thing is such that there is a time at which it doesn't exist, it doesn't follow that there is some single particular time such that nothing exists, or else possibly nothing exists, at that specific time. Uh, and of course, once again, we can hear our good pal Ed Phaser speak to this problem. Phaser says that Aquinas is not guilty of the quantifier shift fallacy here. This is another one of those long quotes. Phaser writes, It is widely held that his further, his meaning Aquinas, it is widely held that his further inference to the effect that if everything were possible not to be or contingent, then at one time nothing would have existed, is clearly fallacious. Specifically, it is claimed that he is guilty here of a quantifier shift fallacy, of inferring from everything has some time at which it does not exist to there is some time at which everything does not exist. This is called a quantifier shift fallacy because the quantifying expression, everything, shifts position from the first statement to the second. 
that it is a fallacy can be seen by comparing the argument above with parallel arguments that are clearly fallacious, like, you know, if every student in the room owns a pencil, it doesn't follow that there is a certain single pencil that every student in the room owns. Similarly, even if every contingent thing goes out of existence at some time, it doesn't follow that there is some time when they all go out of existence together. An alternative possibility is that even though every contingent thing goes out of existence at some point or other, there is always at least one other contingent thing that continues to exist in the meantime, and this overlapping series of contingent things could continue on infinitely. But common though this objection is, it is not in fact fatal to Aquinas' argument, for he need not be interpreted as arguing in the fallacious manner described. As several commentators have suggested, what Aquinas really seems to be getting at is the idea that given an infinite stretch of time, and given also the Aristotelian conception of necessity and possibility described above, that is to say, the one that I described earlier in the video, then if it is p even possible for every contingent thing to go out of existence together, this possibility must actually come about. For, again, at least given an Aristotelian conception of possibility, it would be absurd to suggest both that it is possible for every contingent thing to go out of existence together, and yet that over even an infinite amount of time this will never in fact occur. Possibility here entails an inherent tendency, which must manifest itself given sufficient time, and an infinite amount of time is obviously more than sufficient. Hence, if everything really were contingent, there would have been some time in the past at which nothing existed, in which case nothing would exist now, which is absurd, and so on, and Aquinas' argument would, up to this stage in the proof at least, be vindicated. Now, I have two principal rejoinders to what Phaser says in response to this quantifier shift fallacy allegation. First, it seems that Phaser's rejoinder simply replaces one quantifier shift with another. For it simply doesn't follow from the fact that each thing has a tendency or disposition to go out of existence, that there is some tendency or disposition for everything together to go out of existence. Nowhere did Phaser or Aquinas demonstrate that there is a tendency or disposition for everything together to go out of existence, but that is precisely what is needed in order to avoid the quantifier shift fallacy. And that's true even if we assume an infinite past, right? We would still need this kind of tendency or disposition for everything together to go out of existence in order to infer, by means of the Aristotelian conception of possibility, that this possibility would eventually come to pass. Um, but again, Phaser has not justified from the fact that each thing has a tendency or disposition to go out of existence, that there is some one tendency or disposition for all things, that is to say, everything together, to go out of existence. So it seems to me that he's simply replacing one quantifier shift with another, or at least one uh, non sequitur inference um, with another. Second, even if we grant Phaser or Aquinas that there is a tendency or disposition for everything together to go out of existence, and even if we grant, like, this supposition of the infinite past, right, the same problem that I articulated earlier in the video re-arises, right? For this tendency or disposition will be realized only if the manifestation conditions for the tendency or disposition are satisfied. But Phaser gives no reason whatsoever for thinking that this is, will, or must be the case. Uh, he gives no reason for thinking that the manifestation conditions for this particular tendency, for all things or everything to go out of existence together, he gives no reason for why those manifestation conditions is, will, or must be the case, even in an infinite past, right? I mean, if you had um, a, a match in a drawer for an infinite past, even if it's an infinite past, right, the match is never going to catch on fire because the manifestation conditions aren't there. Um, it would be utterly inexplicable if it caught on fire, if it's just sitting there in the drawer, say. And that's because the manifestation conditions need to be there. They need to be met in order for the match to light on fire. Uh, without those manifestation conditions, then even if it has that tendency, uh, and even if the past is infinite, it's never going to manifest that tendency within that even that entire span of t infinite time, right? And so we need this further claim, we need this further premise, this further uh, supposition that the manifestations for the tendency or disposition are or will or must be satisfied at some point or other, which uh, a, a phaser nor Aquinas uh, justify, it seems to me. So uh, once again, I think that um, this problem that I've articulated, uh, namely the problem in terms of the quantifier shift, still retains its force, it still has teeth by my lights at least. So let's turn to premise six. So recall premise six. If it would be impossible for something to begin to exist at or later than t, then it would be impossible for something to exist now. Now, my principal problem with this is that the consequence simply doesn't follow from the antecedent. For this assumes that the supposed time t, at which there could have been nothing existent, is a time earlier than the present, right? But no justification is presented for this assumption. 
For all the argument shows, the single time t at which nothing would exist could easily be a future time. Even if we grant that there is some time t such that there could have been nothing at t, it is an open question as to whether t is earlier than or later than the present. This means that the consequence simply doesn't follow from the antecedent, since if the t in question is later than the present, it is simply false that it would thereby be impossible for something to exist now. This would only follow if the t in question is earlier than, or perhaps simultaneous with, now. At the very least, we need some extra reason as to why this t uh, is or must be earlier than the present. That's the principal problem that I'm going to raise for premise six. Uh, once again, uh, you know, I want to emphasize the person-based nature of justification. For more articulation and elaboration of that, you can see my video, Why Am I an Agnostic? All right, and so let's go on to premise 19. So recall premise 19. If there exists at least one thing that is necessary per se, then God exists. I kind of have two different responses, and this first response is one that I kind of already made earlier in the video, but essentially, supposing that we work with the understanding of necessity and contingency that Phaser proposed, well then, all we really get here is something that is everlasting, but whose everlastingness is not derived from without. And, at the very least, substantial work lies ahead in order to derive religiously significant divine attributes from that. Uh, it's also worth noting, moreover, that even if we could infer the existence of an entity that could not possibly fail to exist, that is to say, a thing that exists with robust metaphysical necessity, and even has this necessity of itself, this by no means entails classical theism, or I would even contend theism as such. The being that exists of metaphysical necessity could simply be the neoclassical theistic god, or a panentheistic god, or what have you. Or it could be a naturalist-friendly necessary thing. Uh, for a bunch of different potential proposals for what that might look like, you can look at my video, I think it's Existential Inertia, A User's Guide. Um, and it might also be in part one of my response to intellectual conservatism on existential inertia. Of course, one might bring in further tools of argumentation here, right? Like so, for instance, one might bring in the essence-existence distinction and argue that a necessary per se being must be such that its essence and existence are identical. But now the third way simply collapses into the de ente argument, meaning that we no longer have the third way as an independent argument for God's existence. It would become wholly parasitic on the de ente argument. And consequently, its force as a standalone argument then would be neutralized, which is really the sole aim of the detractor of the third way in this dialectical context is to neutralize the argument in question and to show that it isn't a successful argument on its own rights. Now, Faser himself actually thinks that you can infer purely actual from metaphysically necessary. Uh, he says, for instance, why should we think of the necessary being as God? Consider first that from the fact that it is necessary, it falls that it exists in a purely actual way rather than by virtue of having potentialities that need to be actualized. For if it had such potentialities, and existence, then its existence would be contingent upon the existence of something which actualizes those potentialities, in which case it wouldn't really exist in a necessary way after all, end quote. Now, ig ignoring the fact that he seems to be presupposing that there can't be a metaphysically necessary thing that depends upon another, well, because, listen, uh, if there could be a metaphysically necessary thing that depended on another, then he would simply be wrong to say that um, its existence would be contingent upon, in the sense of dependent upon the existence of something which actualizes those potentialities. But it doesn't follow from that, that it wouldn't exist in a metaphysically necessary way. It would exist in a dependent way, but that's different from metaphysical necessity, which is a modal notion. The other one is a kind of dependence or a causal or grounding notion. But ignoring that fact, right, let's just ignore that fact. Um, th I mean, this is just, it, it's, it's very wrong on many levels. Uh, no, this does not follow. It does not follow that it exists in a purely actual way from the fact that it is necessary. And the reason is because no one says that, who, no one who says that God is not purely actual, no one says that uh, he exists by virtue of having potentialities that need to be actualized in order for him to exist. No, his potentialities are not related to his very substantial existence or his being, such that there are no potentialities that need to be actualized in order for him to exist. No, instead, his potentialities concern his various, perhaps accidental properties, like being Lord, being Redeemer, uh, entering into mutual relationships with creation, and so on. None of those things are such that they are potentialities that need to be actualized in order for it to exist, or uh, in virtue of which it exists. So uh, this is just completely uh, missing the point when, or completely missing the mark uh, with respect to 
people who say that God is necessary, but yet not purely actual. And uh, finally, I won't spend long in, in this particular portion of the video because I was articulating what I mean by Amorian Defeater, why these are neither exhaustive nor representative, and I kind of just articulated what these are and gave the links to them in my previous video on Aquinas' first way. So if you're curious, you can check out that portion of that video uh, with respect to the Amorian Defeater section. I just want to emphasize that it also applies to this third way here. So uh, that's yet another kind of line of attack or perhaps defense, depending on where the dialectical context is. So my assessment ultimately is that the third way doesn't succeed, at least by my lights. And so an outline of the pri principal problems or primary problems of the third way, um, along with a variety of problems within each of these categories, uh, are really right here, right? We have premise 1, 4, 6, and 19 are such that they are false or at least unjustified by my lights. And fifthly, fifthly, that's interesting, and fifth, <laughs> and fifth, many Morian defeaters. But really, my central hope, my central aim is that these serve you in your pursuit of truth and in your investigation into the fundamental nature of reality. And again, as with my previous video on Aquinas' first way, I want to emphasize that um, criticisms and argumentation are based on personal sight, and there's always going to be, or at least oftentimes, there's going to be room for um, reasonable disagreement based on where people are uh, on their epistemological, on the epistemological landscape. And then upcoming videos. So uh, again, these aren't necessarily in order. They aren't exhaustive. Uh, and I've already articulated or gone through some of these uh, in my previous videos and explaining what they are. But uh, there's an interesting addition that I wanted to notify you guys of that uh, in early January, uh, I'm going to have Liz Jackson on uh, to discuss Pascal's wager. So um, she's a philosopher who's done some excellent work uh, on that topic. Oh no, and we have reached the end. Oh goodness. So um, don't forget to like, subscribe, turn on that little bell for notifications. Consider supporting me on Patreon. Uh, much love and many thanks to you guys who support me on Patreon. In fact, there are some really dope Patreon benefits, if I do say so myself, on there. You know, you get all the, all my transcripts, all my, um, transcripts. That sounds like school. Transcript. I just mean like transcripts of videos and things like that, uh, that I, that I've completed or put together. Copy of my book. There's also a free copy of one of the book recommendations that I had in my previous video. There are also, um, interesting scholarly papers that I have made available to patrons and, uh, early access to videos and so on and you can you can go there there's a link in the description and it describes the different uh, patron benefits and finally uh, most importantly share share this with your friends if you want to help other people uh, investigate the fundamental nature of reality and if they are potentially interested in philosophy of religion and philosophy more generally I think that they will benefit from both this video and my channel so if you'd be so lovely and so inclined do please share this video uh, and so uh, what else is there to say then i'm joe schmidt and this is the majesty of reason and peace out <laughs>